Almost every time the subject of gun control comes up, the AR-15 is singled out as one of the main weapons to be um, controlled. Uh, which kind of makes sense at first, because the AR platform represents the most modern and effective guns available, and they're really, really popular. Widely owned by citizens across the entire United States, and widely used by militaries around the world. And politicians are talking more and more about that military side all the time. Military-style weapons designed to kill as many people as possible. Of military-grade weapons. Military-style assault weapons. And this isn't just a generic anti-gun sentiment floating around either. All these clips are from U.S. legislators who are attempting to pass the assault weapons ban of 2022, which would ban the import, sale, manufacture, transfer, or possession of a whole bunch of semi-automatic weapons, specifically calling out the AR-15 and various derivatives of it. Now, why is that? In the past, gun control advocates tended to talk about just the sheer quantity of the bloodshed that was going on in our streets, but this argument no longer really holds up because in my lifetime, gun deaths have actually gone down, gun ownership has gone way up, and the ease of looking up statistics on the internet has gone up. For example, uh, there's possibly about 300 million rifles in the United States, and those rifles are used in roughly uh, 300 homicides per year, which is, one in a million. That's why most of the conversation today is talking about the potential danger of these rifles, especially the military ones, because those are super, super scary. These are weapons of war. These are weapons of war. They don't just kill, they decimate. The argument, therefore, goes like this. If there is a class of guns being used by the military, then those somehow must be only useful to the military. Since the military of today uses AR-15s, therefore nobody outside of the military needs an AR-15, and therefore nobody outside of the military should have an AR-15. You don't need an AR-15. And you'll notice that a lot of the things that have happened happened with automatic weapons. And I don't think any civilian needs to have their hands on a military weapon like that. But this idea is based on a very flawed assumption. The assumption that the state militaries have always invented and made and owned the very best weapons, and civilians were either disarmed or kind of straggling along behind with a different category of arms. But that's not how technology works. If there are technological advancements that improve the power, accuracy, ergonomic, safety, adaptability, or affordability of weapons, then these improvements are gonna benefit private shooters in exactly the same ways that they benefit state soldiers. The AR-15 can be a weapon of war and the very best platform for civilian use at the same time. That's why the title of this video is not just clickbait. If you own a firearm, which you should, it should be an AR-15. And if you end up needing to use that firearm, which hopefully you won't, you will want it to be an AR-15. Not only is that basic science, it's also basic history. Allow me to explain. The very first firearms that were made were cannons. And we're gonna just kind of skip those because here at T-Rex Arms we focus on small arms. The very first man-portable weapons were basically miniature cannons on a stick. You hold the cannon in one hand, you hold the torch in the other hand, and you touch the two together. Powerful, but not very accurate, not very ergonomic, and you gotta find somewhere to put that torch while you reload with all of your loose powder. And so on the scoreboard here, you can see that it's not bad, but there's a lot of room for improvement. And the first improvement was the match lock, where you add this special lever here. It holds a slow match that is burning, and then you can swivel it with one or two fingers here. Now, couldn't really have the match burning in the rain, couldn't really aim with it very well at night, but at least now you can use both hands. So, pretty significant stuff. Then there were a whole bunch of very innovative experiments with wheel locks and snap locks and dog locks. And finally, the flint lock was perfected in France around 1610. This was a fantastic improvement. Firing was now nearly instantaneous, making aimed shots possible. Using flint instead of a lit match meant that you could keep this musket in firing condition for days. And it made reloading a lot safer. And because the frizzen protected the pan where your loose powder is until the actual moment of firing, uh, you could even use a flintlock in the rain, or at least in the damp. Put your faith in God and keep your powder dry. 
This was such a great improvement that all firearms became flintlocks. Smoothbore muskets, rifled muskets, shotguns, pistols, even some cannons were fired with flintlocks. For 200 years, this was the dominant military weapon and the dominant civilian weapon. The only difference between the two was that a civilian was more likely to have, say, a nicer flintlock, uh, more likely to have a rifle barrel because accuracy mattered more to the individual, and military units were more likely to be issued smoothbore muskets because overall firing speed mattered more to infantry as a group. It's a good soldier, Osner? Yes, sir. The ability to fire off three rounds a minute in any weather, sir. Now, there were a lot of wars fought with flintlocks over those two centuries that the flintlock dominated the landscape. But one of the most interesting was the War for American Independence. Even though Britain had a great track record of centuries of armed citizens and militias and privatized defense, by the 1770s, they had shifted gears to grow the empire, and they had built up a standing army of professional soldiers, the most powerful army on earth, and they carried the Brown Bess flintlock right here. And on a dark night in April of 1775, the British Empire sent about 700 of those professional soldiers to disarm the private citizens of Concord, Massachusetts. And this was not normal. Professional soldiers disarming civilians was a blatantly tyrannical move. So much so that not only did the Redcoats lose the physical battle that day, they also lost the PR battle. The fact that the British Army had fired on their own subjects while trying to destroy their private arms turned European sympathies toward the colonists. The state placing limits on weapons ownership was not acceptable. The American colonialists capitalized on this by declaring their independence, and obviously the war was on. When the war was over, the new American nation instituted a Second Amendment to protect the private ownership of arms. Now, some people will say that the founders were only planning to protect the American right to keep and bear the uh, civilian-only hunting flintlocks. But remember that at the time, this was a military rifle, the best combat arm on the planet. It was the same weapon fielded by the British Army. And then this over here was the one fielded by the Colonials, the Continental Army. The founders would not have made a distinction between these two weapons by law because there's no significant difference between them in reality. This was the pinnacle of firearms technology, and as such, it offered basically the same advantages to anybody who wanted to use a firearm for anything. The idea that state militaries are having better guns or inventing better guns than the free civilians that's just not supportable. In fact, the next generation of firearm technology was not invented by a government or by a military scientist, but by a Scottish pastor, the Reverend Alexander Forsyth. His goal was to make his gun better for hunting birds by replacing the flint and the pan of loose powder with a percussion cap. But that made this gun better for everything. This development, which hit the market in the 1820s, provided an increase in reliability, accuracy, uh, and even affordability. Once this advancement is available, nobody wants the old system anymore. In fact, the only folks using yesterday's ancient flintlock technology are, ironically enough, those huge state militaries that have armories full of dusty old flintlocks. It took them ages to upgrade their existing weapons to the new caplock system, and by the time that happened, there was a new invention that was on the horizon, breech loading. Now, technically, we already had some experimental breech loading technology all the way back in the 1500s, but it wasn't until there was some new manufacturing technology in the 1840s that breech loaders could actually be safe and accurate and mass produced like this Sharps rifle. Sharps rifles, this is an original, by the way. This was made in 1852, and these are a little hard to come by now, mostly because of uh, Thomas Magnum and his friend Higgins. Legendary Sharps. You know your weapons. It's a lever action breech loader. An experimental weapon with experimental ammunition. 
and it was a very successful experiment. This falling block right here opens up the rear of the barrel so you can now load the rifle more or less in a firing position. That means that you can shoot a lot quicker. It means that your chamber pressures are higher and more consistent so you get better accuracy. And now something interesting happens. If you remember how previous militaries had preferred smoothbore muskets to their rifled counterparts, that's because they wanted to reload and fire them more quickly. Accuracy was way less important than overall firing speed. Uh, shooting faster was all that mattered. Faster, faster, faster. Faster! Move! Faster! Faster! How to go low? Low! Faster! However, when breech loaders show up on the scene being accurate and fast, things have changed a little bit. Most military leaders are actually very slow to adopt these faster firing guns because they don't want to waste ammo. What hasn't changed is that civilian weapons technology is always one or two steps ahead in the small arms space, and civilians were much faster to adopt the Sharps rifle than any militaries, even in the 1860s. At this point, the United States of America and the Confederate States of America were fighting a war. Both sides had governments and armies being supplied by official government armories. And even though this war does spur on the development of new tactics and technology, things like using observation balloons to spot for artillery, civilian inventors and civilian manufacturers are still making advances for the civilian market, which outpace the military weapons. Advances like the Henry Rifle Lever Action Repeater. Because once you can load a rifle from the breech, and once you combine the percussion cap with a metallic cartridge case, all sorts of possibilities open up. You ever seen what a Henry rifle can do in the hands of somebody who knows how to use it? This lever action mechanism right here loads cartridges a lot faster than my puny human fingers can, and it does so from this two magazine that holds 15 rounds. So technically this is a high capacity magazine in a bunch of states. Now, individual Union and Confederate soldiers used their own private money to buy tens of thousands of off-the-shelf civilian weapons like these lever-action rifles because they were superior to what was actually being issued throughout the war. Now, eventually, uh, it became undeniable that repeaters were the way forwards. The Union Army began issuing these, um, but individual soldiers still bought at least five times more Henry rifles with their own money than the government ever did. And meanwhile, a private company in Germany was inventing the next generation of rifle that would take the world by storm. Not since the flintlock has a firearm action been this ubiquitous, and not just a general action. This specific Mauser bolt was used in nearly all the rifles that were used in all of the world's wars from the 1890s to the 1950s, and that is a lot of wars. The irony is that when most modern gun control activists picture a civilian sporting arm, this is what they picture. They got the wooden stock here, box magazine that only holds five rounds, and of course, not semi-automatic. A long, heavy rifle that is a little bit cumbersome. But this is, uh, this is not a sporting arm. This is basically the most military rifle ever made. Almost every major army in the world bought this exact same pattern from Mauser, and uh, every minor army fielded captured Mausers. Drop your guns. About 10 million of these were made over half a century, and that's not counting all of the millions of copies and slight variations that were made by other countries and other companies. This one is made in Turkey, and we're not sure if this is actually a licensed copy or, uh, you know, the other kind. But technically, there's a whole bunch of these that are still seeing combat all over the globe, even though technologically it is obsolete. When World War II rolled around, the U.S. government started buying up an awful lot of new weapons. Again, mostly from civilian designers and civilian manufacturers. But at this point, there are so many countries involved in this war, using so much new technology, it's very difficult to keep track of all of the firearms advancements. There aren't any giant quantum leaps or totally new classes of weapon exactly, but there are some very clear trends. 
This is the M1 Garand. It represents a new trend because it is semi-automatic. Uh, it has a larger fixed mag, allowing for very quick reloads from the top. And that means that a high volume of fire is capable from this man-portable package, but still accurate enough to make the most of the ammo that a soldier can carry. This rifle was a very, very big deal. I, th I think it's really odd here. We've got the author of the bill claiming that an M1 Garand is not a military weapon, when, in fact, I'll have to read him a quote again from General Patton. In my opinion, the M1 rifle is the greatest battle implement ever invented. Yeah, and when the war was over, the government would sell these battle implements, these surplus M1s, directly to American civilians. The best small arms in the world, insurance against aggressors. But like I said, there were a lot of small arms being used in World War II. There were sniper rifles, there were anti-tank rifles, shotguns, submachine guns, paratrooper carbines, and a lot of valuable lessons were learned by all sides. And one product of a lot of these lessons is the AK-47, designed by Mikhail Kalashnikov to be the ultimate battle rifle of the Soviet Union. And this platform contains all of the modern trends developed up to this point. It's a lot smaller and lighter than the M1 Garand, and it fires a smaller bullet with less recoil. Instead of a fixed magazine, it has this detachable box mag holding 30 rounds, so way faster reloads. Instead of the rifle stock that we had on these others, we have a pistol grip for better control. Uh, this one's, you know, maybe not actually from 1947, but you get the idea. And the gas piston system that drives the bolt is great. So for the first time in 500 years of fire and development, we also have something else. We actually have a military rifle that was made for the military only. This was called the people's rifle, but uh, guess who couldn't own it? The people. Remember, most gun control advocates claim that military only weapons and citizen disarmament have been the norm throughout history, but that is not the case. It isn't really a trend until the 20th century mostly among totalitarian governments that went on to kill millions of their own people. Now, completely coincidentally, the Soviet Union and their allies made millions of these rifles. Probably about 100 million of them were produced. Uh, same as the death toll. They made so many of these partly because totalitarian governments understand that all power comes out of the barrel of a gun, but also partly because they considered the AK-47 to be a disposable weapon to be issued to disposable conscripts. And yet, I mean, it really is a fantastic rifle, especially when you consider that the main design constraint was that it needed to be manufactured in a giant government-run factory manned essentially by slave labor. And its purpose was strengthening a giant statist army that would, again, brutally murder far more of its own citizens in peacetime than enemy combatants in war. Now, while all this genocide was happening, on the other side of the world, a private company was building a similar rifle with almost the exact opposite criteria. The M16 has a lot in common with the AK. It is lighter, it is smaller, it has the pistol grip, it has the detachable mag, etc. But it presupposed an end user who was better trained, and it required the most advanced manufacturing techniques and materials of the day. It was not commissioned by the government, but in 1957, Armalite submitted their AR-10 for military trials, and the military loved it. I'm just kidding, they kicked it right out of the contest because <laughs> it's kind of hard to imagine. Today, this black plastic and aluminum shape is seen as the quintessential military-style rifle, but the army guys running the test thought that this looked like a toy for civilian home defense. They wanted a sturdy wooden battle rifle like this, not something that looks like it was made by Mattel, you know, for kids. But Eugene Stoner and Jim Sullivan kept submitting this rifle for the tests. And six years later, even the army had to admit that their AR-15 with its smaller bullets, the new direct impingement gas system and fewer moving parts was the superior product, the next evolution of small arms technology. So it was adopted and named the M16. 
By the way, I know this is not a real M16. I'm not going to tell you why. There's going to be a million commenters pointing out everything that's wrong with it. So just read down below. And the real M16 had some stuff wrong with it too. It took another six years for the army to get around to buying the right ammo, uh, the right mags, any cleaning kits, but the bugs got worked out over the course of the Vietnam War. And now, 60 years later, there have been a lot of improvements. Today's AR-15 is one of the lightest, lowest recoil, easy to use, most capable rifles in the world. And where the AK-47 originally beat the AR platform on reliability, uh, improvements in the design, ammunition, and magazines have pushed the AR to the top of that list, and it's also winning on cost. Originally, the M16 was very expensive to build since it required CNC machining that was very new and complex molds. Uh, very expensive compared to the AK-47 that was just being stamped out of sheet metal in giant Soviet factories. However, there have been all kinds of private sector developments made in CNC milling and all kind of machining work. So that means that this is way, way more affordable in the 21st century and higher precision. So today, I mean, it's really winning in all the categories here. And I don't need to make this case, everybody already knows. There are 20 to 30 million AR-15s in private hands today. Tens of millions of Americans have already decided that this is the most practical and affordable and best platform to own. And sales of the AR-15 have skyrocketed. Coincidentally, gun statistics have dropped. So why exactly does the assault weapons ban of 2022 target this weapon and weapons that have its specific features? Yes, it is a weapon of war, but so is every single item on this table, even the hand cannon. So could it be that our representatives in Congress simply haven't got the first clue how guns work? What this stabilizing brace, which is depicted here, when, a, when attached here, it turns this weapon into an automatic weapon. This bumps, it becomes a bump stock. Mr. Cicilline has his, his gun features mixed up. It's neither a stock nor a bump stock. I think it's important that if you're gonna ban these things that you actually understand what you're banning. I urge him to get Wikipedia up as soon as possible. The internet is about to educate him. That's why we're here. But it's not just unelected officials who are colossally uninformed. A lot of people are confused by this military weapon argument. I mean, why can't gun nuts just buy the wooden gun. It's kind of like the difference between a black car and a brown car. It's okay to ban black cars if people can still buy the brown car, right? But that's not the right argument. It's more like the difference between a modern car with seat belts, electric fuel injection, anti-lock brakes, adjustable seats, affordable replacement parts, and a 1926 Model T. Old cars, just like these old guns, are very cool, but they're not going to be your daily driver, and they're not for emergencies. I would not pick a Model T to drive my family to the emergency room, and I would not pick this rifle to defend my family in an emergency. And let's talk about the emergencies. Ten years ago, back when the CDC still had some credibility, they did a study on the defensive uses of firearms. It's very easy to document crimes involving firearms. There's about 300,000 per year, but people using firearms to prevent or stop crimes is a lot harder to measure. So the CDC's estimates was that this happens somewhere between 500,000 times and 3 million times every year. And we actually see it happen. Sometimes a private citizen stops a mass shooting so spectacularly that the mass media is forced to at least mention it, which means that, generally speaking, at least for now, a lot of gun control advocates are still publicly okay with the idea of self-defense. They're quick to say they don't want to ban every gun, just these scary black ones. And that's why they're so focused on this completely arbitrary and imaginary distinction between military-style arms and sporting arms. And they define this in the legal language of the bill. A banned firearm is something with a detachable magazine plus any one of six other military features. Pistol grip, adjustable stock, uh, the ability to mount modular attachments on the handguard, a barrel shroud, and threaded barrel, uh, or a grenade launcher. Now, that last one definitely sounds like a military feature, but 
These other five are just all the best basic gun ideas since the 1940s. And not everyone wanting to ban the guns is as dumb as they sound. When Thomas Massey was asking why brown equals good and black equals bad, David Cicilline, the main sponsor of this bill, actually said something interesting, possibly by accident. The first is, you know, we had some lecture about some historic firearms and some relics. Those firearms are old and clunky and difficult to use and are not the subject of mass shootings. He knows that these older guns are more difficult to use, and he knows that American citizens are regularly forced to use them to save lives, and he doesn't care. David Cicilline is saying that you can't have modern technology. You can only have old and clunky and difficult to use. Not just hold fewer bullets, but be more difficult to use. He wants you to have slower reloads, grand thumb, less accuracy, no way to run modern lights or optics, and a platform that is harder to control and categorically less reliable and less safe. In an emergency, he wants you to be worse off. Things seem to be getting crazier and crazier. And not just you. When I say everyone needs an AR-15, I mean everyone. I'm not just talking about military age males with adequate training and a subscription to this YouTube channel. I'm talking about everyone. I'm talking about people who are smaller, younger, older, disabled, specifically people who may be weaker than others. I'm talking about people who need more protection. I'm talking about my mom. My mom needs a weapon like this. Let's go over those military features. The 30 rounds in a single mag is great because she doesn't have time to practice her reloads for hours a day like Lucas. The pistol grip is great because that's how human wrists work best. And being able to adjust the stock to her size is important because she's not the same size as your average Marine. And being able to put a flashlight on the gun, very useful for seeing in the dark. Being able to put her thumb over the barrel shroud is good and running a flash hider is good. I'll concede that she doesn't need a grenade launcher for home defense, uh, but the other five military features are literally what make this rifle fit my mom better than this rifle. The lack of military features on this old clunky sporting weapon are significant, but the irony is that uh, a professional army could work around this rifle's weaknesses with training and logistics. So trained Marines could still fight with this thing really well. But my mom can't exactly. That means that these military features actually give a disproportionately greater advantage to my mom than the actual military, especially this adjustable stock. I mean, all it does is this. Now it fits my mom, now it fits my dad, now it fits my dad when he's wearing body armor. Oh, by the way, civilians should own body armor too, you know. And surely everyone knows that this adjustable stock doesn't magically transform this gun into an overpowered, unstoppable killing machine, right? This is attempting to exploit a design flaw for pe persons with disabilities and use it to convert this into a bump stock. So the sooner you recognize that's not a bump stock, the better off we'll all be. Attached here, it turns this weapon into an automatic weapon. This bumps, it becomes a bump stock. But what he's showing us here is not a bump stock. I mean, no one has said it is a bump stock, but what we are saying is it operates like a bump stock. It is not a bump stock. It has never once on this planet ever been used to accelerate the rate of fire. It's operating as a bump stock. That's the functional result of it. That can't even function in your wildest fantasies as a bump stock. It's the brace coupled with the buffer tube. So that operates as a bump stock. Every semi-automatic AR-15 has a buffer tube and a spring. It's not some trick, it's not some gimmick, it's not a bump stock. Yeah, I'm sorry, they're, they're, they're both banned. So let's get back to the why. Why focus on banning the most dependable, most widely owned, least criminally employed rifle, the AR-15? I think fixating on the specifically practical, practical features, features like, like the adjustable, adjustable stock, stock gives us a clue, clue that this bill can mean only one of two things. Either proponents of the assault weapons ban are irrationally terrified of plastic parts that they don't even remotely comprehend, or they want you significantly disadvantaged in an emergency and utterly dependent on somebody else. And it's not like the bill limits these horrifically powerful weapons of war to just the military. There are exceptions for local cops, state police, and any federal agency or department. So the IRS can have them, 
The FDA can have them, the Department of Education can have them, but you can't. My mom can't, and the people can't. And history teaches us that when the people are not allowed the same technology that the government is allowed, first of all, that's fairly rare in human history. But also, when it does happen, the results are not great. And that's why we believe that everybody does need an AR-15. I'm not saying don't exempt the FDA. I understand why the FDA wants weapons of war. They conduct armed raids on Amish farmers uh, undertaking the crime of selling raw milk. <laughs>